so we love you, Lord, and we thank you for this opportunity to be in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Scotty. Let's give it up for them again. That was wonderful. All right, so we're continuing our tough topics, and uh, today I get the tough topic that's going to hit all of us, including me in one way or the other, and that's addiction. And um, I just want everybody to keep an open mind and realize that on every road there's somebody affected by addiction. Every single person in this room is affected by addiction, and we're going to look at what the Bible says about that um, right now. This is about five sermons in one that are compressed as an overview, and if, I, if I'm ever blessed enough uh, again... And it's an honor just to be able to speak to you, and it's humbling. Um, to, I will drill down on uh, each of these areas. And so it's, it's kind of an overview of what addiction is. Now, addiction does occur in the Bible. Um, it, it occurs in chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians. And it says in verse 15, it says that they were addicted to the ministry. Ministry is a picture of water. Jesus says, if any man thirsts, he cries out in a loud voice. He cried for you. Have you cried for him? He cries out in a loud voice in John chapter 7. He says, if any man thirst, let him come drink of me. And he who believes, he who puts his whole trust in me, he says, out of his belly will flow rivers, not trickles, not drops, but rivers of living water. That living water is important, but that's the Holy Spirit. That's the works of the Holy Spirit. That's the Word of God. The Holy Spirit wrote the Word of God. It's a living, breathing document that every page comes alive and it, it all points to Jesus and his finished works on the cross. But when you serve somebody and you minister, you're, you're letting the Holy Spirit influence you, and you're putting God above yourself. So I've got some questions for you, and uh, I want you to consider. And then we're going to buckle up. We're going to go through a lot of verses real fast. I'm going to have Michael put one, verse, or one uh, slot on the screen that you can take a picture of with your phone and go back and read all this. But some questions I want to I ask you... Um, occur one of them occurs in John chapter 5 there's a guy sitting at the pool of Bethesda the word Bethesda uh, means mercy there's five colonnades that's grace and he's sitting there waiting for the water of the world to come help him for 38 years and there's a spiritual significance there he's been sitting there looking at the water waiting for a solution and Jesus sees him do you know Jesus sees you and he, and he walks up to him and he asks him he says in verse uh, 6 of chapter 5 he says "Wilt thou be made whole do you want to be well do you want to be made whole? Can I get everybody to say whole is the goal? Whole is the goal. W-H-O-L-E, whole is the goal. And, and so Jesus looks at him, and the guy starts to give him all these excuses. And Jesus doesn't force him to get up. He says, arise. Kume, I think it is in Hebrew. He says, get up. He says, your faith has made you whole is what, what he's getting at. He's telling him to walk. He says, pick up your mat, go. And, and so he, he, why does he get him up? So he can go tell others about him. In fact, the guy didn't even know who, who cured him. And then Jesus came back and explained it more to him. So that's the goal. The whole is the goal, to be made whole, to be made complete, to be made well. W-H-O-L-E. See, we have all these parts, but we want to, God to take it and make the whole out of us, the way that he wants to put them together, not the way that we do with our broken pieces and these broken vessels that are our body. So that word addiction in, in Greek, um, it's tasso. And that means, to, it's a military term, it says to willingly go under and submit to the order of. When we get into our addiction, it's really idolatry. We give up self-control, and, and, and we get under the authority of something else. And it becomes idolatry. And the very first of the Ten Commandments, if you go to Exodus chapter 20, it starts off, it says, for I am, not I was, not I will be, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It says, for I am the, not one of many, Lord, the master, the one you follow, your God, it's personal, who brought you out of the house of bondage in Egypt. Why? To be your God. For I am the Lord, your God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Addiction starts making us put other gods before Jesus. And, and once we start doing that, all the other Ten Commandments fail. It's always best to have the voice of experience over the voice of intellect. And I definitely have the voice of experience here. I fail all the time. But there's a solution. And the solution for the pollution is the dilution in the Word of God and the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit. But you have to drill down and get it. The water just didn't come up. You've got to work on it. It's there. It's within you if you've received Jesus. But as you break that first commandment and you start having these idols and these altars, that's where you commit your 
your, your sin at, your addiction. Maybe it's sitting, maybe you're addicted to outrage. You can be addicted to a lot of things, right? Glenn Beck wrote a book on this, Addicted to Outrage. Maybe you like getting the news constantly, and it's not the good news of Jesus. When you should be in the good news, you're getting addicted to the outrage. Can you believe these people? Or maybe you just get a little bit of news where you can feel intellectual. But I'm going to tell you, the devil only needs two truths and a lie to get you hooked. And that's how he works. He'll give you enough truth, and then he'll turn around and give you a lie. But as you start doing that, and you have these altars, maybe it's in your chair as you watch that instead of, instead of what you should be watching or ministering. Or maybe it's where you look at your pornography. You know, lust is a horrible thing. You're lusting for somebody who's a child of God, a woman who's made in God's image, somebody's mother, daughter, or, or husband, or whatever it might be, somebody's son. And, and so you have an, an altar and an idol there. Or maybe it's where you go to do your dope. Or maybe it's where you go to drink. Maybe it's where you go to eat just your comfort food and the sugar that you know is eating your body up. Maybe you're bound up by being mad at people. You like being the guy that gets mad. You know, that's self-inflicted bondage. Unforgiveness is self-inflicted bondage. But the Bible says in Deuteronomy to tear down those altars, to chop them up and to burn them up. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Now, how do I do that? Well, the first thing you do to tear it down is you admit it's there and ask God to help you. The second thing you do is you have to burn it up. Well, how do I burn it up? Well, Elijah called down fire through prayer. So you pray about it, and you ask God, purify me, make me whole. How do I chop it up? Well, the Word of God is a two-edged sword. Remember, it, it pierces, it divides. Johnny Hunt put it this way, it's the only sword that stabs you in the heart and makes you live instead of killing you. You go to the Word of God. Every time you want to do a drug, every time you want to look at something you shouldn't, every time you want to drink something you shouldn't, every time you have a thought you shouldn't, you go to the Word of God, you take that thought captive. Jesus says in John 15, you have been made clean by the Word I've spoken to you. Now, the question is, do you want to be made whole? Another question, because people ask me, and I've dealt with this for a long time, I was a miserable human being because I was saved, but I was in addiction. Can you be saved and be in addiction? Absolutely you can can you lose out on all the blessings that Jesus has for you? Well, in John 15, he says, you've been made clean by the word I've spoken to you. But then he goes on to say, but if you don't abide in me, your branch gets thrown in the fire. That's your ministry. You can be trying to lead somebody to a bedroom and lead them right into hell. You can miss out on all the people that you're supposed to be leading to Christ because you're more worried about leading them to the bedroom or leading them to the bar or leading them to the dope house or leading them into some conversation that seems harmless. Next thing you know, you're flirting. Next thing you know, you're, you're, you're talking and texting and doing things you shouldn't, right? So you can be, but God doesn't want that. You lose out on all the blessings God has for you in the place of promise. You, 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 you have to answer the question, is there conviction in my addiction? Can everybody say that? Is there conviction in my addiction? If you're not convicted and you're caught up in idolatry, putting something over, over where God should be, and you've lost self-control to it, and you're not convicted about that, then guess what? You're probably not saved. This is tough topics. This is tough conversations. But it's not a conversation if I don't say it. My calling is to tell you what the Word of God says, not what Casey thinks, not where Casey fails, nothing like that, not what Landmark thinks. Landmark is a Bible-believing church. We are a Spirit-filled church because the Spirit of God is in the Word of God, and we teach the Word of God. And the Word of God convicts you, but that conviction causes contrition, a broken heart, which causes confession. I need a Savior. Help me, God, which causes conversion, turning from that, which causes confession, telling people Jesus is Lord and he's the way out. Now, can the truth be known? Well, Jesus says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The truth, Jesus, he says, I am the truth, I am the life, I am the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. We live in a world where these kids from the media, most evil demon in America, social media who have their own addiction, tick-tock, 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 right? The media tells them, you've got to decide what bathroom to go to. God's already decided this. It's in the Word of God. They're so confused, they need truth. We all do. We don't know what to believe. Jesus says, I am the truth. I am the way to be made back right with the Father. I am the life, eternal life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's that simple. So we know that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom according to Scripture. Right there, the Spirit equals freedom. She just sang about that a while ago. So let's look at what the Bible has to say as you ponder the question, do you want to be made whole? And, and is there conviction in your addiction? So, so let's go all the way back to Exodus. Remember, everything in the Bible points to Jesus. In the Old Testament, is the New Testament concealed? And in the New Testament, is the Old Testament revealed? 
Augustine said that thousands of years ago. He also says education without salvation equals devious people. Think about that nowadays. That's just kind of a side note. He's a very smart guy, or was. But So if we go back to, to Exodus chapter 5, there's this picture of addiction where it starts. And it's on every page. And like I said, buckle up. This is about five sermons in one. You can go back and read it yourself. But there's hunger brought the Israelites into Egypt. And Joseph was there, and Joseph was a type of Christ. And Joseph says, what was meant to kill me will be used to save lives. That's what Jesus wants to do with your addiction. Ladies, he wants to use what you've been through, what you've come out of, what you have come out of, to save lives. Romans 8 says everything works together for God. And if, you're, if you love him and you're the called according to his purpose. And, and so in chapter 5, there's the devil, which is Pharaoh. There's the taskmasters, which are a picture of your addiction. There's bricks that have to be made, which are a picture of whatever it is you're using. And straw has to make the bricks. And, and that straw is a picture of whatever you, you, maybe money or whatever you do to get to make the bricks. Now, it starts off with Moses, the man of God, speaking the word of God, and he says, let my people go. Do you have addicted people in your family? Have you told the devil, let my family go in the name of the blood of Jesus who died on a cross, who came out of the grave for us? We put our faith in him, let my family go. Now, sometimes it's a slow process. It took 10 plagues to get them out. But, but you have to cry out. You have to tell the devil that, and you have to pray for your family. Um, Shauna, I don't know if, if Deborah's here today, but she'll tell you. She, she prayed for Shauna and said, let, let my, my daughter go, and now she's back. She's addicted to the water of ministry the way we're supposed to be. What 1 Corinthians 16 says, they're addicted to the ministry. Uh, Blair got let go. Blair's here. Chip's here. I could go through Rex. All these people that are ministering now because they've realized this is what I'm supposed to be doing, not what the devil put in the way. The devil tried to rob him. If he can't have your, your soul, he wants your ministry. So he'll do whatever it takes. But this Pharaoh, it was a different Pharaoh, he got mad when he said, let my people go. And so he told the taskmasters, he said, make them make more bricks with less straw. That's what addiction does. See, at first they were making these bricks, right, before this, this Pharaoh came in. And it was probably fun. Like, wow, look how creative I am. I'm making these things with my own hand. Not, not with God's hand, but with my hand. And, and, and I'm making them, and I'm putting these bricks down, and I'm taking straw and mud, and it all seemed cool, all this creativity. And um, the problem with making bricks yourself is, is you'll wall yourself in, right? Every time you have a problem, you'll put a brick in the wall. There was a counseling theory, and, and Pink Floyd did this whole uh, The Wall album off of it, and they, they had a movie. And, and you start putting bricks in the wall every time you have a problem. And the wall gets so high, the sunlight can't come in. And the water comes in incorrectly. You see, it, they even say in that song, said the wall was too high, as you can see, no matter how he tried, he could not break free, and the worms ate into his brain, just like leprosy. You start walling yourself in with all your creativity and all your addiction and, and this habit. And it might be something as simple as smoking weed. It might be taking a drink here. It might be whatever it is. But pretty soon the taskmaster starts saying, you've got to make more bricks because the devil's telling him that. And you have less straw. So now you're going out and, and it says in the Bible in chapter 5 of Exodus that they were picking up stubble. That's going, hey, can I, can I borrow some straw? Hey, hey, I'll prostitute, I'll do whatever for more straw, but I've, I've got to make these bricks. Hey, can you pay my bills for me? Because I've got to make more bricks. Hey, can you help me out somehow? I've got to make more bricks. But eventually, after a lot of people died, a lot of innocents died, they were let go. Exodus 14 says, stand still and see my salvation. When they cried out to Jesus, they cried out to God and it's opened up and they get to walk through the Red Sea and they're saved. They're, they're saved, but they're, they're in the wilderness. God takes us to the wilderness to teach us before he takes us into the promised land. But he wants us in the promised land. That's a picture of ministry. And so they, they do what we call relapse when you deal. I don't like the word recovery because recovery just gets you back to, to normal. Jesus says uh, that he wants us to be made new. It says in Corinthians, it says um, that you're made new and old things have passed away. You see, if anybody's in Christ, they're made new. So... As they're in the wilderness, in Numbers chapter 11, they start looking back to Egypt. And they start going, wow, we had fish and cucumbers back there. All we have out here is manna and a cloud by day and a fire by night and water coming out of a rock and all this provision. But they start wanting what's back in Egypt. 
And this is relapse. This is what happens. People start looking back instead of praising God for where they're free. And those people died in the wilderness. It says that Caleb was of a different spirit. Joshua said, there's giants, but we can take them. We had a cloud by day and a fire by night. God's with us. And they got into the promised land. The kids that they thought wouldn't get in, they got in. Don't ever say, well, these kids, well, they had addicted parents. They can't get in. God can do uh, miracles, but you have, you have to cry out to him. He cried out for you. You have to cry out for him. So let's look in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 5. I think it's verse 8. Um, they're in Zion. Right now, uh, Jerusalem, you see it, that it's getting surrounded, just like Jesus predicted, and there's war going on, and Jesus says he's going to return to Zion. Now, when the Romans came in, they flattened the two hills of Jerusalem, but the southernmost hill was called Zion, and it had these tall walls, and in there were these people called the Jebusites. The Jebusites are always a picture of the strongholds or the addictions in your life. And, and the things that you, you, you lose self-control to. See, it's all about self-control. Can everybody say something for me? Give it up. Give it over. Get under. See, it's a paradox. It's an oxymoron. To get self-control, you have to give it up. Quit trying. Give it over to Jesus and those who are the hands and feet of Jesus and get under the power of the Holy Spirit, the water. So you got to give it up, you got to give it over, and you got to get under. So David right here has these strongholds in, in Zion, and he says, w what are we going to do? And all these people are saying, you know what, they could put blind people, and, and they could put lame people there, and he still couldn't get in. But in verse 8 it says that David came in through the water shaft. This is a prophecy. If you want to get the strongholds and the addictions out of your life, you go to the Word of God, which is the water of God. Jesus says, you have been made clean by the words I've spoken to you. You keep reading the Word of God. Every time you want to do something, I promise you it works. You fall down, you cry out, and you say, God, I want to follow you. Help me. And you start reading the Word of God. It's a supernatural book written by a supernatural being to supernatural people. It will supernaturally clean you up and change your life. So let's look. What about drinking? You know, this is a tough topic. People say drinking. Well, I can tell you this. If you don't pick it up, you never have to put it down. Can everybody say that? If you don't pick it up, you never have to put it down. So Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1 says, Wine leads to false courage. Hard liquor leads to brawls. What fools men are to let it master them? See, the problem is we think we've mastered it, and it slowly masters us. Proverbs 23 talks about it. Let's see. Paul says, don't be drunk on wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. There's the solution. If we go to 1 Peter chapter 4, right now, if there's ever been a verse that's applicable, Peter says, be sober, pray. The end of all things draws near. Huh, so if I want to drink, I can go pray because the end is near. It's right there. There's never been a time where you're so close to the end of the world. Not just because time keeps moving forward, but all the prophetic signs are here. You know, World War II was there, and you say, well, that, they must have thought something. Well, Israel wasn't a nation then. Right now, it's all here. Be in prayer. And, and if, you, if it's a problem, you see, if the speaker's a problem, I'm trying to walk straight, it's in the way. Anything that creates a problem is a problem. So I either go around it or I move it. And if I can't move it myself, I ask somebody to help me. That's why Shauna and I started Unbound. You see, see I used to sit in church and pray that somebody would help me. And, but I was scared to take that first step of asking for help. See, the first step on a million-mile journey is the first step. And it's usually the hardest step. But once you get to moving forward, you keep moving forward. And when you fall, you fall forward. But you ask people, help me move this. I can't move it. We're here to help you. We never, ever want anybody to sit in church with an addiction that can't get help. You come see me, we will pray with you. There's a whole army of people right here whose chains have been broken. They've been set free who want to help you. So it's right there. You flip the page, 1 Peter 5. He says, be sober. Be sober. Be vigilant. Your enemy, the devil, roars around like a, like a roaring lion, prowls around like a roaring lion. Excuse me. He says, wait to see him who he can devour. You see, it might just be one drink or two drinks. You might be under control. But you get in that car wreck and you kill somebody, guess what? You're not going to be spending Christmas with your kids. Some other dude or some other lady is. You're going to be sitting in a cell with somebody using the bathroom right next to where you lay your head, worried if your kids want to talk to you on visitation day. But if you never pick up that drink, you never have to worry about that. You never, ever have to worry about that. 
If you can't avoid picking it up, then there's a problem. Get some help with it. And I'm going to show you the solution right here to getting the help if you hadn't picked up on what the solution is yet. You want to be addicted to the water. So let's go to Luke. Luke chapter 17. And in Luke chapter 17, starting at verse 11, going through 11 through 19, um, go home and read this yourself. Pray about it and see what God reveals to you. But I'm going to show you something. There's these lepers. And leprosy is something that creeps in. You, you can be around it and you may not get it, but you stay around it. It's going to happen. Harper told me the other day, Shauna's husband, he says, you stay in the barbershop long enough, you're going to get a haircut, right? You keep going to that bar and going to that bar, sooner or later you're going to slip up. Maybe, it, maybe it's lust. Maybe it's, it's uh, alcohol. Maybe it's drugs. Maybe it's fighting. Maybe it's, it's whatever it is. But if you don't go around it, you don't have to worry about it. But they, they knew that they were messed up. Leprosy is always a picture of sin and addiction. And these lepers are sitting there. There's 10 of them. And uh, one of them was different. You know, when I started using drugs and drinking, it was all because I felt different. I would fight because I felt different. I would do whatever because I felt different. And I, I, I honestly think that if you ask most people who have been caught up in addiction, maybe it's food, it's because they didn't feel like they fit in, even if they did. They did something was missing. And, and we all have this big cross-shaped heart hole in our heart that, that, that goes right there that needs to be filled. Only the love of Jesus can fill it. And, and so, so they cry out. They see Jesus, but they had to hear about him. You see, how can they know if they hadn't heard? Have people heard about Jesus through you? That's what you're called to do. You see, your life should be a picture of the Word of God and, and of the love of Jesus. People may not read the Bible, but they read people who do. So make sure they're reading the right version. Because I promise you, they're looking at you. And, and they had heard about Jesus, and they're sitting far off because they couldn't be, even be around people. That's what addiction does. It, it distances you from, from people who love you. But they had heard about Jesus, and they cried out. Remember, Jesus cried out, if any man thirsts. He cried out for you. Have you cried out for him? And they cried out, and, and they, they said, Master. So, so they recognized we need help. They cried out. They recognized that he's the master. They said, Lord. In other words, I want to follow you. Then they said, have mercy on me. Salvation's that easy. You have to want it. You have to have a contrite heart and not cry out and say, I need help. Jesus, forgive me. And then the next verse says, Jesus saw them. Jesus saw them. Do you know that Jesus saw you in your addiction? Jesus saw you in your mistakes. Jesus saw you in your pain. And men, we often come down on women about abortion. But most men are guilty of it when a woman's guilty of it. You encouraged it, you okayed it, you greenlighted it, and you're the man, and you're supposed to be discipling your loved one, not taking them to bed. And, and so Jesus saw you when that happened. But here's the beauty of it. No matter what you've done, he's waiting with open arms to forgive you and love you. He just wants you to acknowledge him as Lord and to cry out and say, have mercy on me, I made a mistake. Forgiveness is right there. He's waiting. Cry out to him today. And, and so whatever it is you've done, Jesus sees you there. He sees you in your addiction. He sees you in your pain. He sees you in your misery. He's there, but you have to look unto him. And he tells them the next thing that they do. He says, go show yourself to the priest. So now they're going to be obedient. So they cried out. They recognized they needed help. They recognized him as Lord. They, they asked for forgiveness. You know, have mercy on us. And now they're obedient. It says, as they went on their way, they started being made clean. But remember, whole is the goal. So they get clean, and that's what God wants you to do. As soon as you start getting clean from your addiction, once you cry out to him and you believe that he can save you, he wants to use you to witness. And so he sends them to go witness to the priest. Because way back in the Old Testament, in Leviticus chapter 14, it talks about leprosy, 13 and 14. And there's this ritual that has to happen. But he's going to let the religious people, the church people, know by using these lepers who he is. And, and, and he... He tells them, he says, go show yourself. And so they walked to the priest, and they knew that nothing other than God could cure leprosy. And, and so the priest had this thing. They would examine them, then they would take two doves. And they would take the doves, and they would put one in an earthen vessel. Jesus came down, and he robed himself in flesh in an earthen vessel. So that our broken vessels could be put back together the right way. And it says that they had to kill that dove and run it under living water in the Hebrew. Living water, like that came out of Jesus when he was stuck in the side. And they had to kill it and take the blood and put it on the other dove. And they had to take scarlet, which is a picture of royalty. They had to take hyssop, which is a picture of healing, Jehovah Rapha. And then they had to take cedar, 
which is a type of wood with a fragrance like our praises. And they rub it on that one under living water, and it's set free. Jesus came down, he died on a cross, he went into a grave, and he came out to show us that if we put our faith in him, we can be set free. Now, why a dove? Well, you can't make this up. So there's nine primary feathers on a dove's wings. Out of all the feathers on his wings, none of them that got it that point back to the head. Most birds, it doesn't point to the head. The Holy Spirit always points back to Christ. And there's nine feathers. There's five on the tail. Out of the tail feathers, there's many tail feathers, but there's five primary ones that got it. The church has a five-fold ministries, prophets, preachers, teachers, evangelists. Uh, my wife has her five-fold ministry. She gives me when I don't act, right? But there's a five-fold ministry, right? And it guides the church. Now, why nine? Well, let's look. Nine is a picture of a pregnancy, right? Fruit. So we've lost self-control when we're in addiction. Well, if you go to the ninth chapter of the New Testament, which is Galatians, if you go to chapter 5, verse 22, 5 plus 2 plus 2 is 9, you see the nine fruit of the Spirit. It's one fruit, and it's got nine parts. The ninth fruit, the very last one, that is birth, as you give it up and you give it over and get under, it's self-control. It's temperance. So the goal is to give it up, give it over, get under to get it. And that's what happens. So just like a pregnancy is birthed, from that, as you start trusting to Jesus and you do what these lepers did, you start gaining self-control. So they go back, but only one of them returns, the one that was different. And it says that he fell down at the feet of Jesus and he started glorifying God and praising Jesus. If you want to be, get clean and you want to stay clean, you go back to the one who cleaned you up to the cleaner and stay at his feet, praising him, worshiping him. Right there, that's where the cleanliness is. Stay there, be clean, stay in his word, do what he says. And, and, and this is a picture of people, you see it in this church, who, who go off and, and they get free, they get clean, and they stay at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus looks at him and goes, well, where'd the other ones go? He said, this one that was different, he says, he says, arise, thy faith has made thee whole. Thy faith has made thee whole. The goal is to be made whole, not to just get clean. And so why does he tell him to, to arise, go on your way? Because he knows he's going to go tell others about him. Shauna, it's kind of hard not to tell people about Jesus when you've been set free. Evan, it's kind of hard not to tell people about Jesus when you've been set free. We could go through this church and name person after person after person who is addicted to the water ministry, who's going off and telling people about Jesus because we know what we've been through and we've been set free. And we pray for other people. Go to these people. Use them. They're the hands and feet of Jesus. These are people who can help you in your addiction, help your neighbor. Pray for those who are in addiction. Now, I'm going I'm to start closing here in a, in a minute, but I'm going to go to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 is where I used to love when I was in my addiction. Because there's an eye problem there, and Paul had an eye problem. And the problem is I, me, my. It's over and over. I don't do what I want to do, and I do what I don't want to do, and I do this, and I do this, and I don't do this, and I don't do that. And, and I used to say, well, you see, that's okay. It makes it okay to do it. No, it doesn't. Because if you lick your fingers and you turn the page, it's Romans chapter 8. You never read 7 without 8. Seven's all about I, me, my. Eight's all about the Spirit. So in there, it goes through, I don't do what I want to do, I do what I don't want to do. But when you get down to verse 24, the next to last verse, it says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will free me from this body of death? Man, so back in those days, we know that Jesus was crucified on the cross, and he hung there for you, and, and it was a horrible, horrific, humiliating death. It was shameful. But they had another way. If you killed somebody at the Romans, it would treat you. They would make you lie down just like this, like Jesus did with open arms, but you're on your back. And they take that dead body and they lay it on you. And they bind you to it. You are bound to that body of death. And everywhere you go, you have to walk around facing that dead person. And you start to stink as that body stinks. And guess what? Your family don't want to be around you. Your friends don't want to be around you. You can't pay your bills. You have to say, hey, can you take care of my family for me? Because I can't do it anymore. Maybe they go over to the state. And you walk around with this heavy, heavy body. And you can't eat. You can't sleep. Sound familiar to any of y'all have been addicted? And you're walking around with this heaviness. And everywhere you go, you have to carry it. And, and you start getting infected from it. You start to decay from it. 
Jesus says, come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke. It's easy. It's light. You see, God wants to free us from this body of death. We walk around with this heaviness, but you start to hurt, and your health gets bad, and everything gets bad, and you, you start to die from it. The death creeps into you. The death creeps into you, but there was one thing that could happen. If somebody loved you enough, if they loved you so much, whether they knew you or not, they could go, Mr. Roman Centurion, I'll take on that body of death. And, and they would take a, take a knife or their sword, and they would unbind you. They would loosen you. They would let you go. And that body of death would fall down, and that person would have to lay down, and they would take on that dead, rotten corpse. That's what Jesus Christ did for you. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so Jesus took on that for you. So when you flip over from Romans chapter 7 to Romans 8, there's this verse and it says, therefore now, what's it there for? Because of Romans 7. It says there is no, not a little bit, no condemnation for those who are in, not a little bit in, who are all the way in, in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the Spirit. There it is. Right there. There's the solution. There it is. You've got to be in the Spirit. How do I get down in the Spirit? Well, you've got to drill down. As you read the Word of God, you start seeing it. In chapter 8, over and over, 21 times the Spirit's mentioned. More than anywhere else in the book of Romans. In fact, over half of the book of Romans where the word Spirit's mentioned, mentioned in 8. Verse 15, it says that God has not given us the spirit of bondage. It says that the Spirit of God, which is God, intercedes for us and prays for us when we don't even know what to pray. So if you're in addiction, you don't know, just say, God, please. God, thank you. God, help me. And it says that no height, nor depth, nothing can separate us from the love of God. You have to stay in the Word. You have to stay in prayer. You have to let other people pray for you. But it all t starts with giving it up and saying, God, help me. Have mercy on me giving it over to God through people that are willing to help you or whatever it is, and, and then getting under control of the Holy Spirit. You've got to drill down. So I'm going to end with this if the band wants to come up. In, uh, in West Texas, or East Texas, where Dr. John was from, they've always said uh, uh, David Wilkerson and Keith Green and Leonard Ravenhill said that it was the most fertile ground for uh, starting a ministry. And, and Dr. John, who, who got this church rolling, who came from East Texas, uh, started ministry there. He started uh, street preaching in Lindell, Texas and, and, and stuff. So, um, but there was a farmer there back before Dr. John started going there. And he owned a lot of land, a whole lot. He had cattle on the hill like Abraham, but he was poor. And, and he just constantly worked and he plowed the ground and he tilled the ground and, and he was constantly working and the bank wanted to take the property. The bank wanted his property so they did everything to try to mess him up. He became a slave to that property just like, just like the, uh, the taskmasters back in Egypt. And, and he went without eating a whole lot even though he grew food but he had to sell it all so that he could survive, so that he could keep his farm. And, and one day this geologist came to town and uh, he walked around a little bit and he ran some tests and he came over to him and he, and, and he told him, he said, uh, he said, sir, you're, you're living in poverty. He said, yeah. He said, well, I want you to know something. You're sitting on the biggest oil reserve in the whole United States. It's right under your feet. If the Spirit of God lives in you, it's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's inside of you. You've got to drill down to get it. Jesus said, lest a grain of wheat die and fall to the ground, it abideth alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. You have to die to yourself and say, here I am, God, take me. You have to drill down in the Word of God. You have to ask for forgiveness just like the lepers and cry out. And there has to be conviction in your addiction. That conviction will bring contrition. That contrition will bring confession. I need help, which will bring conversion. Your life will change. Then you'll start confessing Jesus to everybody everywhere. You can't help it. When people meet you, they will meet Jesus, and you can help others. God's called you for something bigger, but it all starts with crying out to him. And right now, I just want to ask you, whether you've followed Jesus your whole life or whether you've never followed Jesus and you want to for the first time, will you stand up? You're going to have to stand when you leave anyway. If I can get everybody to stand up who wants to follow Jesus. And then at the end of this service, you can come to this altar.
At an altar, something always has to die. If you're making altars to your idols, your spiritual life is dying there. It dies so that the, the negativity and the things that are against God can live. But if you come to, whether it's this altar or whether you're standing somewhere or wherever you fall down on your knees, let yourself die and let Jesus live through you. Okay, but right now, if I can just get everybody, if you want to follow Jesus, just to pray out loud right now as we pray. And then if you want to come down to the altar and pray, we'll pray with you. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. For everybody who will pray. Thank you for dying for me. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to follow you all my life. Forgive me of my sins. In Jesus' name, amen.